Hi there, class. Uh, this is the lecture for chapters six and seven. Six is about politics, and seven is about uh, legal issues internationally. So uh, we'll jump right in. A quote of the week this week is from Will I Am saying, Traveling in Europe made me understand that America has an island mentality. No one exists except us. Uh, there's a whole other world out there, but most Americans, all they know is America, the marketing plan. Jumping into chapter six, here's the Cliff's Notes. So the first principle to talk about is sovereignty. What makes a, a country sovereign? Um, and the, the textbook definition is that sovereignty means that, these, that a nation is independent. There is no higher uh, power to control it. Uh, so it has full legal equality with uh, another country. Now that's not to say that all countries actually have equivalent power, because um, they, they don't. And a lot of times, uh, even though a country has... Uh, has sovereignty, it has a lot of pressures on it from neighbors and other things. But in, in theory, if a, if a country is sovereign, that means it's, it has uh, legal independence. It's free to govern the territory that it controls. Um, it is free to choose its own political, economic, and social systems. And it has the power to enter into agreements with other nations. You know, a lot of our conversations around uh, international trade really center around agreements between nations. Uh, sovereignty also, um, sovereignty refers to powers that the that a country exercises in relation to other countries and also that it has the supreme power over its own members. In other words, there's no higher legal authority um, uh, or, or source of control over the citizens than the country itself. Now sometimes there are issues where that, uh, even that is challenged, uh, such as like international uh, war crimes or, or crimes in international courts. We'll touch upon, upon that in chapter 7. So if you're going to do business, how do you fight a country? And the, the answer is, is that, that you have to be very well resourced to even have a prayer of that. Otherwise you just need to understand the political environment in the country. Um, and you fight by by following the rules and playing along. Um, now, here's an example. This is this was uh, what about two years ago in 2015. This is um, these are seizures from the um, U.S. Customs and Border Control of ivory that was um, poached and it was being traded illegally. So. The things at first were like, well, hey, you know, they're they're keeping uh, elephants from being killed in Africa by um, uh, thwarting poachers, and ultimately what they did is they they put they stacked all of this uh, ivory up, all this artwork up in Times Square, and they torched it all. They destroyed all of it. There's millions of dollars worth of of ivory here, but it is uh, the the um, customs agents wanted to make a statement that if they remove the economic incentive for killing the animals that provide this ivory. Um, that's the statement they wanted to make. And that seems like that's for a good cause. Uh, the one thing you have to consider is, is that what they're exercising here is the power of confiscation. That is, they are, um, they're coming in and taking something that is in the possession of a citizen of another country or in a citizen uh, of the United States. And that is something that, um, that's not to be taken lightly. I mean, here we're talking about doing it for a good cause, but what if it was North Korea? What if, what if uh, goods were being confiscated just because the... Uh, the dictator wanted to have more stuff. Um, it's a it's a serious power when you're talking about power of confiscation. Now um, we've talked about uh, in chapter one how the more stable uh, the environment is, the more business thrives. What business hates is volatility, um, and and you see that like with financial crises and other things where business uh, business can thrive and survive in you know unfavorable conditions. But volatility is the hardest thing. Not being able to plan ahead for what to predict and what to expect is the hardest thing for business. So what causes instability within the political framework of a foreign country? Well, political parties, right? We, we just saw a transition in the United States about political power from the Democratic Party to the Re Republican Party. In the United States, we have a long tradition of this being a peaceful transition. That is not the case in, uh, in all other countries. Sometimes that transition is, is difficult. Um, and sometimes there are wars and, and uh, lots of instability making it, it unpredictable, unpredictable for business. Um, pressure from nationalist groups, right? People within a country who say, look, we, you should only buy and sell um, American, for example. Um, 
when uh, when economic conditions are poor, in other words, when people are not thriving, not feeling like that they're making progress, um, that's when people tend to close ranks and be more nationalistic. And along with that, a bias against foreign investments. We talked about that a little bit about um, U.S. multinationals post World War II. Uh, going and investing in Europe and in Latin America and how people in Europe and Latin America looked at those with skepticism and, and questioned the motives of the, of the U.S. multinationals. Um, and that, that type of bias can increase instability. And this is the main point, right? The more volatile and uncertain things are, the tougher it is to, to run a, uh, a good business. Now, here's... Um, we talked about changes in, in a political party. In the United States, one of um, one of Trump's uh, planks that he was elected on had to do with treatment of international trade, and we'll, you know it's yet to be seen exactly how that how that plays out. Uh, but people specifically voted for um, either for Trump or for Clinton based on their positions on trade. And uh, the interesting thing is, let's say that you were a, a a company in a foreign country doing business in the United States. Now you've had a turnover in terms of political party. What what does that mean for you? Does that what does that mean for your prospects? We've we've heard a lot from China, from Mexico about how they're a little, they're a little concerned about what exactly uh, Trump's election is going to mean for them and the, and the trade that they're currently doing in the U.S. Um, understanding so if, if change in political parties can bring about volatility then it stands to reason we need to understand what the motives and philosophies are uh, for all the key political parties in a place where we want to trade. The other thing we talked about is nationalism. Um, na and nationalism means um, a favoritism for your own country over, uh, over the goods, over the workers, over uh, the other business attributes of another country. Well, um, when you kind of have this uh, national pride or the circling the wagons around the, the home country, that can cause a problem for international business because you're not seen as as uh, playing on an equal uh, as being on an equal playing field. Here we talked about Bush with or here's a this is President Bush at 9/11, uh, and there's all this feeling in the country. And I don't know how many of you are, are old enough to remember this, but all this feeling that hey, the United States has been attacked and and citizens of the United States are banding together. Um, they have this feeling of that we need to stand together in order to um, to fight this this terrorist threat. Well, disaster, war, recession, these are things that bring about feelings of nationalism. And so the response that we saw at 9-11 was, was very consistent um, with how this happens in countries around the world. And sometimes that turn, that gets translated into um, business ideas, business practices, such as, hey, we're gonna we're gonna promote Buy American, and um, this happens you know with whether it's the police department that is buying American-made cars for their cruisers. Um, for a long time, you you only saw American-made cars uh, in the police departments around the country. Now you see all all kinds of brands, but the more nationalistic we get, the more um, we look to, to buy products that are made domestically. Um, and this is this kind of speaks directly to what we're seeing with President Trump, which is he's he ran on a nationalist uh, platform, on a nationalist uh, philosophy. And so along with that is the idea, hey, that we want to erect barriers to trade as a way of uh, exercising protectionism around United States manufacturing, United States companies, United States jobs. Um, as we talked before, that usually that usually doesn't work. That usually is is not a recipe for economic success. Um, but it's all rooted in this idea of nationalism. Um, also, sometimes a country can do something. We see a little bit of this with the United States right now with the, I think, a I think there's a little bit, a little bit of this around Trump's um, immigration ban, this 90-day temporary uh, ban on immigration from certain countries that were seen as as being sponsors of terrorism, um, and that makes people well. Hey, we don't want to do business with the United States. Um, you also see a little bit of this in the news about like Ivanka Trump's um, deal with Nordstrom. It's like hey, the the even though this is a domestic issue, the idea is hey, we don't want to trade with somebody that we don't like. Well, this could happen with uh, with other countries. For instance, uh, let's say that people don't like Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Well, they may they may not want to buy Russian goods. Um, 
so so you can be a country can become a target uh, based on on uh, its decisions and choices, and of course, then when countries are are disputing around trade, if you're involved in the, that type of trade, you're involved in trade between those countries, that can can really affect your ability uh, to do any kind of business. Um, you may have to put your operations on hold. You may have to withdraw. Uh, you may have to look for other alternatives. So here's some examples of trade disputes. Uh, the text is a little dated on this, um, so it's not quite as current as it could be. Uh, but hey, uh, these are the Chinese currency not being free floating has been a this has been an issue for years. Uh, hey, if we're buying goods and we're exchanging um, dollars for yuan, for example, um, if the if the current the Chinese currency isn't free floating, well, how do we know that it's not just manipulated? And the truth is, it is manipulated, but it's it's um, the question is how big of, a, of an impact does that make? Um, ban on beef imports into Japan. So Japan ha, um, said, hey, we, we're not going to buy beef from the U.S. We think that that beef raised in the U.S. is inferior to beef raised in Japan, and so we don't want any U.S. beef in Japan. And and that nationalistic idea caused the, a, a dispute. So all the, the American beef uh, folks are it's like, well, hey, this, is, this isn't right. They, they're appealing to the government, but uh, that's what you got. Um, Airbus and Boeing, I think, is also a good one to mention. So the, the thing you have is Boeing is a private company. They do have government contracts, but they're, they're a private company. And their biggest competition is Airbus. And Airbus' uh, majority shareholders are the governments of France and Germany. And so as a result, um, Airbus doesn't have to compete in the same environment. It has the, the sponsorship and advantages of having governments as, uh, as shareholders. Um, and so are the subsidies that are created... Uh, I mean, government has a lot of incentive to create subsidies for itself. And so is, is that a fair playing field for Boeing uh, to compete with Airbus? Um, so going back to the era of the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and Cuba's essentially the, the overthrow of the um, government by uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in Cuba uh, and the adoption of socialism and communism in, in Cuba, uh, Cuba kind of became persona non grata to the United States, and so as a result, there's been trade sanctions that have been there, you know, for since the 1960s until now. One of the the things that President Obama did in his last year in office was work to try to uh, alleviate uh, trade sanctions with Cuba. Um, the uh, Iranian Revolution of the 1980s. If any of you guys saw the movie Argo, you know there's there's these disputes about. The Shah of Iran, and and uh, who was an ally of the United States, he gets overthrown by the Ayatollah. So now Iran is no longer an ally of the United States, uh, and so trade embargoes ensue. And then the the fallout from the the first Gulf War in the 1990s, um, where uh, oil producing countries in the in the Middle East, uh, some of them are are friends to the United States, some aren't, and so uh, those that aren't suffer embargoes from the United States. Currently, Iran is a big uh, question mark. You know, one of the uh, one of the things you have here. This is Ahmadinejad, who is no longer the the uh, leader in Iran. But um, the UN and the United States just kept laying on economic sanctions as Iran was developing uh, its nuclear program. And so some of this has been thrown into question and turmoil with the um, Iran deal that the U.S. Uh, negotiated with Secretary of State John Kerry in the last, what, about 18 months now. And one of Trump's big um, uh, talking points has been that he felt like this was a bad deal. But currently, the Iran is, Iran's economy is severely hampered by trade sanctions. Now, um, does the form of government that your country has create a likelihood that um, for instability? And the answer is it does. Um, as we've looked at... Um, We've looked at governments whose political systems were based on uh, some of the big economic systems, and we'll talk about that here, right? So, for example, um, democracy. Do you have a free market-oriented uh, government? Does that create more or less instability? Well, it means that you may have more economic uh, factors that affect your instability, but in general, uh, democracies are more stable. Uh, dictatorships. Um, I think I mentioned last week about uh, the deal I was doing with a, a company that was making retirement facilities in China and how they felt like, well, you know, 
having a communist dictatorship is um, really efficient because they come along and if they want to build something, they tell whoever's there to get out. If they don't get out, they still, you know, come in and bulldoze their homes. It's not very, um, it, it's not very ethical in terms of human rights standpoint, but in terms of getting things done, as long as you're on the right side, you're in good shape. You get on the wrong side and you're in bad shape in a hurry. Coalition government. So um, Israel, um, Italy, uh, they have governments that are democratic, but they're um, in order for any group to have a majority, it needs to be a consolidation of multiple parties. What you end up having with this is usually the the, the last party to join the coalition has all the power uh, because they're the they're the linchpin that takes the the, uh, the that puts the majority over the top, um, and so as a result, that that tends to be a more instable form of government than what. Uh, than the two-party system that we have in the United States. What about countries that are run under uh, effectively a religious rule? Um, well, there's a lot of Islamic law countries where the the um, the politics are tied uh, very much into the structure of the religion and the religious leaders uh, and how they and their roles in government. So. Again, we talked about uh, economic systems. So capitalism, free market system, tends to be the, the most stable, although not totally stable. Um, there's, there's instability even in, in free market democracies. Um, socialism is also fairly stable. Um, the, uh, one of the things that you have is a lot of the opposition to nationalism and globalization that, that was seen over in elections over the past year and a half um, is a result of socialism not delivering uh, benefits to the uh, to the voters. Communism can be stable, um, but uh, as you, uh, if we look at uh, the history, right, the greatest experiments in communism in the Soviet Union, um, not stable for the people who live there. Not a stable platform for doing business. Um, there's lots of suspicion. There's uh, you know foreign companies are looked at as not sharing the same values. Um, and so communism can be tough. Here's a list of, of uh, countries and their government type. Notice that these are, there's uh, even the ones that are like a communist state. That is an economic system attached to the state. Their, their economic systems are different than forms of government. What are the risks? Well, uh, the political system controls the rate of exchange. So in, in China, where the yuan is controlled by the government, if the government likes what you're doing or they don't like what you're doing, the exchange rate for your goods can be affected. Um, what can you say? Can you, If you're a, co a company that runs on uh, a lot of promotions, um, maybe you can't run the type of promotions or you can't advertise your products or services the way that you could in other places. Um, just the, the, um, the work of getting goods in and out of a country um, what kind of paperwork is required? What kind of duties? Taxes are always a big one. Um, does the country have anti-dumping provisions or other price controls that, that affect what you can sell your product for? If you need to establish a base in a country, what are the rules about its workers? Um, this is, is a stark difference between the United States and Europe. Europe has a lot of labor, uh, labor uh, laws that are in favor of the worker. And so it can be really difficult to fire somebody. It can be if you fire them, you still have to pay their wage for a year or, or more. Um, it can be that if you don't negotiate the right terms with labor unions, people won't work. Um, you know, this can be, and, and that exists in the United States, but not to the extent that it does in Europe. Um, in the United States, labor unions are generally, re, um, their power is diminishing, um, where in Europe, it is still very strong and vibrant. South America, a lot of South American countries have strong, um, labor contingents as well. Another thing that you have to reckon with is activism. So activism can cause instability. Usually activists are motivated around um, a particular problem. The problem could be real or perceived, um, but it's got people hopped up. And they're, and sometimes sometimes activism is, is positive. Sometimes this is a, a key to bringing about much needed change. And sometimes it's just a dispute about the way things work. You know, hey, a, a law was passed, that that advantages another group and disadvantages my group. Well, it's time I'm going to go march in the streets. Um, you know, we we saw this with the protests after the inauguration, right? Um, people were were marching in the streets. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of existing movements were co-opted into the protests. Uh, so you saw uh, people who 
were part of the protest because they felt like they were supporting the women's movement. You saw people who were part of the protest because they were supporting the Democratic Party. Um, a lot of uh, the, but activism affects the climate. So if you're if you have a, a shop and everybody's marching outside your shop, that can make it tough to tough to do business. If you are, uh, it's even tougher if what they're marching about is the business you're doing. So if you're in a business and maybe. Uh, like maybe you're Nike and people are, are upset that your shoes are being built by uh, children or by workers that have unfair conditions. Um, there's been the same type of claims about the, the manufacture of the iPhone. Right? Are the conditions of workers there um, uh, appropriate or do they match what, uh, what would be done elsewhere? And where you see, um, also in Canada, you see a lot of this where people are really um, in favor of fair trade, which means that, that every step in the supply chain it follows ethical um, ethical guidelines in terms of workers, construction, uh, environment, other you know other um, ways that your product could be seen as being harmful or have some kind of ulterior uh, motive or or harm. So, uh, lest you uh, think that activism is um, fading, activism is alive and well in our current climate and in many countries around the world. Um, here's a good example from a few years ago. So after the financial crisis, uh, you had Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, in, in my opinion, was one of the most ineffective uh, um, protests uh, I've ever seen, uh, mostly because the, the ideas that were espoused were, were financially illiterate. But, um, but hey, you got a lot of people out, and you had a movement, and, um, and then it kind of fizzled. Uh, something that's maybe a little closer to home is uh, um, there was a, a labor dispute between a, um, I think it was a group of contractors who were building a new building where North Star Alarms was moving to. And this was this was just up here on, uh, on University Parkway. Uh, so I, uh, a friend of mine knew the, the new marketing director at North Star and uh, gave me permission to share this, uh, this example. So here's a little bit of you know, Orem, Utah, local activism. Uh, he says, so second day on the job, CEO asks me to take care of some labor dispute issue in front of our building. We're moving to a new building in the spring, and one of the subcontractors has a beef with the building developer. North Star Alarm has absolutely nothing to do with the issue, as we are simply leasing a space in the building. After a friendly discussion with the sign holders and asking them to stop defaming our name, they would not budge. So as they say, if you can't beat them, join them. So the... the uh, Marketing director goes and puts up a, uh, his own sign. So now it says, shame on North Star Alarm Services for making home automation so affordable. Um, so the U.S. State Department issues travel warnings. I mean, this, this um, is not something we have a lot of concern working domestically, but sometimes if you go to another country and it's obvious that you're, that you're from a rich country like the United States, there's, uh, there's risk of kidnapping. Some countries carry kidnap insurance on their executives that travel. Um, and the State Department issues warnings about travel to certain countries based on the political state or the political climate. The very worst form of activism is terrorism. This is a, this is a couple of kids, uh, and look at how young they are, uh, in Syria. They're in, when, at the time this photo was taken, these kids were actually working with Al-Qaeda. There's another type of terrorism, and that is cyber terrorism. So for any of you guys who are familiar with um, Anonymous, um, this is a group of hackers. They've done, uh, they've done all kinds of things. They've, they have um, protested the WTO. They have um, taken down the website for the government of Nigeria. They have done, you know, just a, uh, a bunch of things. And, and in general, um, they have not been uh, maybe attacked as harshly as they otherwise would have because uh, there's usually some type of moral or ethical um, justification for what they're doing. They're saying, hey, look, we, you know, we outed a bunch of people because they were pedophiles. Or we, uh, and so pretty tough to generate sympathy for pedophiles. Um, and the and the same thing in Nigeria that you know they, they took down the website because uh, of some some human rights violations that were being committed by the government in, in Nigeria, but um, but all the same you know when does it when does the um, when does the vigilante decide to turn on on you? Uh, law and order is uh, a principle that keeps us uh, keeps us with a process for how we resolve. 
problems and disputes. So anonymous still falls into the category of uh, cybercrime. So how do you tell? How do you tell if the country you're going into has political vulnerabilities? Well, it's like, it's like a crystal ball. You can't. Um, the best you can do is do your research, do your homework, and stack the deck of probability in your favor that, that things will work out. Oh, excuse me. Um, also, be very aware if your product or service is politically sensitive. Um, are, you, uh, are you attacking something or are you um, consuming a resource in the generation of your product that could cause, uh, could cause a problem or cause people to, to, um, to not like your product? For instance, maybe your product is harming the environment, right? Maybe you're making plastic water bottles that are getting thrown away or you're making uh, a product that consumes uh, resources like water or trees or minerals. Um, the, and how that uh, how that's done can be a big deal. Um, also, you could you could uh, be seen as unpatriotic. Maybe you produce a product that um, that that ends up getting used, right? Like uh, Google Maps. There was uh, terrorist attacks in India, and they used Google Maps to plan and execute the terrorist attack. Well, Google took some some heat for that. There are insurances that you can buy to protect your company against uh, political risk and instability. You need to decide if, that, if that's something that um, applies to you. Um, and then do you have a way for, under, to, for keeping your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the country? So you know if, the, if something happens, do you have a plan for what to do? Uh, do you know when it, that it happens bef you know, with enough time to, to act or react? Um, and are you able to look at the past and predict kind of how the future might go? This is an interesting chart. These are states, top 20 states in danger of failing. So we don't think about that very much insulated in the United States, but there are countries where the entire country itself is in danger of falling apart. The, that could be everything from their currency goes into default to the government, you know, there's a, there's a coup, there's, um, they get attacked, um, you know, whatever it may be. But the, this is a list of countries that are in danger of essentially having radical change. Now, the government has a lot of power when it comes to uh, foreign investment. Uh, we, we talked about, again, like the U.S. multinationals after World War II investing in Europe and in Latin America. Well, there may be countries that are like, hey, we want you to invest. We want you to invest here. And so we're going to create incentives. And that, those incentives may, um, may create an unfair competitive environment. Uh, usually, these countries are wanting to grow their economies. They're wanting to increase. Uh, we talked about last week or, or uh, two weeks ago about how in, an increased um, economic development means an increased lifespan for your for your citizens. So countries are motivated to to um, to do what they believe is right for economic growth. You just need to understand that as you as you're looking to do business there. What do they What do they believe about economic growth, regardless of whatever the truth may be? So here's uh, since we've got two chapters, we've got two quotes of the week. So for chapter seven, uh, this quote's from John Romero. As a well-known game designer and developer, in marketing, I've seen only one strategy that can't miss, and that is to market to your best customers first and your best prospects second, and the rest of the world last. Chapter 7 is about legal issues. Here's the cliff notes. Okay, so the main thing is there is no uniform law that governs how you do business internationally. So the tricky part about that is, is that... Um, that means you not only have to understand the laws in your home country, you need to understand the laws in the country you're going into, and maybe every country in between, every country where your product passes through, touches, um, anything, any country where your supply chain is active, um, you need to understand them all and make sure that you're in compliance. So where did the concept of the law come from? Well, uh, the oldest reference that we have to is the um, ancient Egyptian god Ma'at. And Ma'at has this... Uh, represents this sense of order and justice. Um, also, the Judeo-Christian ethic is rooted in the law as delivered uh, by Moses. So the, the, uh, the Jewish law, which underpins Jewish and Christian um, ethics, uh, is, is really the root of the concept of the law. So um, there are four 
legal systems that we're going to talk about that you should be aware of, just so that you know that that internationally, um, these are uh, you could go into a country where something different than what you see in the United States is the norm. And so these four give you a pretty good picture of of what they are. So common law versus code law. These two are the most common, especially in Western countries. Um, common law is what we follow in the United States, except for in the state of Louisiana, which follows uh, Louisiana is um, rooted, their tradition is rooted in the Napole Napoleonic Code uh, because they were a French colony before they became uh, part of the United States. Um, and so they're an exception. Otherwise, the United States operates on a common law basis. So common law is derived from English uh, um, traditional law. It's found in England, United States, and Canada, uh, also countries that are influenced by them, where code law comes from uh, the Roman Empire. You see it in Germany, France, and a lot of the non-Islamic and non-Marxist countries. So code law is really common, like Japan is a code law country. Um, it's more common in other places. Here's the difference. Uh, common law is based on tradition and precedent. So if something has happened before, then a new uh, court will rule that that's consistent or they'll find some reason or justification to overturn it. Otherwise, the default is that precedent rules. Um, that doesn't mean that the, that the common law has an answer for every situation. Code law, on the other hand, is designed to um, write codes that, that potentially cover every situation that might happen. Um, so, and it, it, uh, they're intended to be all-inclusive. It covers everything from you know, criminal stuff to commercial and civil. So it's something that, that definitely affects business. Um, under common law, ownership is determined by use. So did you, um, were you the first one to use that trademark, for example? Where co under code law, ownership is determined by registration. It's like, well, even if somebody's been using this for years, I was the first to register ownership of it. And so I, that's where the rights um, reside. A couple of examples of this are things like, uh, under common law, evidence of an agreement could be binding. Like, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, oral agreements are binding. Um, typically, they can be enforced for up to a year. Uh, well, what evidence do I have that that, that it happened? Under code law, it wouldn't matter. It doesn't matter if you if you have an agreement, if you haven't registered that agreement. Um, it doesn't. It's it's as if it didn't happen. Um, under common law, it's like you are expected to do to comply with that, um, barring an act of God. So, so unless you know a tornado strikes, you must comply with what, what the what your terms of the agreement. However, under code law, that's less less harsh and less strict. Um, instead of just acts of God, it extends to things that are unforeseen or that that you couldn't have known. So that could include things like labor strikes. Uh, riots uh, it could include, you know, uh, floods or, or or bad weather. It could include um, unfavorable conditions that happen in the political climate, um, things that you just couldn't expect. Um, it's also noteworthy to know that common law countries are moving more towards a code law approach when it comes to their commercial law. So you see this. A good example of this is building codes. So the the United States, most municipalities in the United States have adopted the International Building Code, uh, the ICC, and the International Residential Code. So here's a quick case study uh, in legal issues between the United States and Germany. So this U.S. company they contracted for thirty thousand pounds of fresh frozen pork livers. And the, the, um, the language used in their agreement was customary merchantable quality. So the U.S. company prepares the goods, ships them to, the, to Germany according to U.S. standards, and Germany says, these don't, these don't measure up to our standards of quality. So now you have a dispute. And the question is, where do you settle the dispute? Do you settle it in the United States? Do you settle it in Germany? Do you take it to some other, other court to adjudicate between the two? Germany's over here, look, we ordered customary merchantable quality, but you've sent us 40% sow livers. Who cares about the sex of the pig the liver came from? Well, we do. In Germany, we don't pass off spongy sow livers as the firmer livers of male pigs. The shipment wasn't merchantable. You owe us a $1,000 price allowance. Um, and so the, the question now becomes, where do you settle this dispute? Um, and a, a, a big part of that is, where's the money? Were they prepaid? Were they, um, you know, or they has it not yet been paid for? So if it's if it was prepaid, 
then the money has already been sent to the United States for the product. It's going to be harder for Germany to get the money back. Um, if they weren't prepaid, then it's going to be hard for the United States to get everything that they believe that they are, are owed because Germany holds the money and the merchandise. And so these are the, the kind of issues that you're faced if you have a dispute across international lines. If they're good enough for American taste, they should be good enough for you. And the, the other question here is, let's say that the American company sues in a German court, or the German company sues in an American court. The question of bias comes up. You know, is the American court going to be fair to the German company, or are they going to have a nationalistic preference and bias towards the American company, and vice versa? The next uh, legal tradition is Islamic law. So there are Islamic law nations where the country is is based and their their legal system is rooted in Islamic law, which basically means it's it's uh, rooted in the Quran. Um, and you see this in in Pakistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and other Islamic countries. The um, Islamic law covers the same type of things that uh, code law and common law do. So property rights, economic decisions. Um, types of freedom, when you can spend money, when you can't, and with whom. Um, the overriding theme in Islamic law is, is one of social justice and fairness. Does, does it make sense? Uh, Islamic law prohibits the payment of riba or interest, so uh, that changes how banking is done. Uh, I, I once, uh, when I was the marketing director at, uh, at Task, before it was Workfront, we had a customer uh, called, uh, they were in in the United Arab Emirates, so and it was the Islamic Bank of Dubai. I uh, called them one time for we were doing a case study and, and just talked to them about that. So they they don't um, they don't pay interest on accounts. The, what they do do is they charge a lot of fees, and so so Islamic banks do great, but they they do it on uh, by charging fees and not by charging interest. So the idea of making money on money is prohibited. Insurance sometimes falls into uh, the category of gambling. And so in some countries, insurance, in some Islam Islamic countries, insurance is looked at as, uh, as being uh, a bad thing. Okay, and then there are still some countries that are throwbacks to Marxism and communism. Now, the, China is by far the biggest co uh, communist country. Um, other, you know, Cuba is still a communist country, but communism in North Korea, communism has has basically been proven to be an economic failure. So the experiment of communism in the 20th century is that it doesn't work. Um, so in China, what you have is the political system. The, the, the people at the top are communist, but they allow a lot of capitalist um, practices because they want their people to make money. They want the country to make money. And so there, there's kind of this capitalist or, or communist head with uh, capitalist... Um, actors uh, in the rank and file. So in a dispute, uh, just like we were talking about with the United States and Germany, the big question is, who has jurisdiction? And there, in some cases, the uh, neither one has jurisdiction, so these cases can be adjudicated at the World Court. So the, the World Court or the International Court of Justice, which is uh, in The Hague, which is in the Netherlands, has a framework for solving disputes between nations. So if you subscribe to international law, so you're, you've um, signed on to treaties that uh, essentially you're, be, you're allowing your sovereignty to be governed by another entity, then you can take disputes to uh, the World Court. So the World Court solves issues between governments. It also adjudicates between a company and a government and between companies of two different countries. So if you fall into that situation and you're in a country that participates in the World Court, uh, that may be where, where you need to go to, to look for redress. Jurisdiction is usually um, attached based on these, these things. If the contract specifies, so if, uh, in fact, you probably have signed contracts like this for your, for your cell phone or for your internet, where it says, hey, the, the company that um, is providing the service is based in Delaware, and so any um, disputes need to happen in the courts of Delaware. So you can write a clause into your contract that tells you where jurisdiction will be. Uh, failing that, the contract can be either where the um, where you made the contract. So if we both if we all got together and we signed the contract in Salt Lake, then uh, it's reasonable to expect that 
the United States courts have jurisdiction, and maybe even the Salt Lake, uh, um, the, the Utah and uh, county governments can can uh, have jurisdiction. Or it may be where the contract was performed. So maybe we agreed in the United States to go do a, a project um, you know, in Spain, for example. Well, it may be because we did the work in Spain that the Spanish courts um, would have jurisdiction. But that's the first question you have to resolve. Where is the, you know, which courts do we need to go to? Now, once you decide where the court is, you don't always have to litigate. There are other options. So conciliation or mediation, arbitration, and litigation. Conciliation or mediation is you enter into a non-binding agreement. So you, there's no nobody going to tell you what to do, but you are entering into a process to negotiate a, re, a resolution. One of the things about legal issues, legal issues are are volatility. You if you if you take something before a judge or before a jury, you don't know how they're going to to respond, and so that's uncertainty. Business hates uncertainty. So mediation, being able to go with a, uh, somebody who's a a skilled negotiator and try to resolve disputes. Um, usually everybody uh, needs to give some, uh, give something up, so, so usually these are not one-sided resolutions. And so if you feel like that you're totally in the right, that may mean that this isn't the option you want to take. But you ask this third party, talk it, talk it out with you and, and the other party, and try to come to, to a resolution. Um, yeah, so these are happen these these negotiations happen behind closed doors. In the United States, we call uh, this settlement negotiations are confidential and don't uh, aren't can't be brought up or used in future litigation or arbitration. Now, in arbitration, this is like mediation in that you're going to a third party to help you resolve your differences, but the the difference is, is that the arbitrator has the the right to give the final say. And so when you enter arbitration, you're saying, well, I don't want to go to the, the cost and uncertainty of uh, a trial or litigation, but I, I am willing to accept the ruling of the arbit arbitrator. I'm going to go make my case before the arbitrator. And so once you sign up for that, then you're bound to, uh, to whatever the arbitrator d determines. So that's a stronger uh, form of resolution than simply mediation. And then litigation is we're going to go fight it out in a court. We're going to take the very limits of what the the law allows us to do to resolve disputes, uh, and we're going to we're going to try take our chances there. And the reason why this doesn't happen near as often as settlements happen is because it, it's uncertain. Could go could go crazy against you, um, and so the chance that it goes your way is usually not re worth the risk. But this is your court of last resort. The other thing is, is that in litigation, a lot of stuff becomes public. So you, on the one hand, you, it's like like when Hershey's, the, the video we watched about Hershey's suing uh, the, the importers of Cadbury's. Well, Hershey's gets a black eye for that. Uh, it's the, Their lawsuit is public. Everybody knows what they're trying to do. Um, and so they take a PR hit for that. Another thing is like the U.S. and Germany example. What if I go to a German court and the German judge is nationalistic, and he, he has a bias against me because I'm a foreigner. Um, the other thing is, let's say that I win. Um, I still may not be able to get the money. Um, I'm going to have to deal with the, the banks in the foreign country. I'm going to have to deal with the collection process, the collection laws in the foreign country. All of this is going to cost me money and time, um, and, and it may be that every step of the way becomes public. So everything I do, that everything I log as an exhibit in my trial, everything that I file uh, now becomes public knowledge. And so it may be that I don't want, it's not worth the cost and time or the cost of, of these things becoming public. I mean, you see this a lot. Like people are trolling patent applications by all the big companies. And the, the thing is, once you file this patent, it's, it's public. Um, and everybody knows. So what about copyrights and intellectual property? Um, you know, we're, we're doing the case right now, uh, this week, about China, piracy in China. Um, well, there are certain laws about how you can protect uh, your inventions and your intellectual property. Um, so counterfeiting and piracy is, is, are two different things. We want to talk about kind of what the difference is. Um, on the one hand, we had this, the case where Apple is doing, um, is doing, or, companies are doing business pretending to be Apple in China. 
and they um, everything looks like it's an Apple Store, but it's not. It's not going the the revenue from that's not going up to the Apple mothership. Um, and what if they do something that harms Apple's brand? Well, Apple spends millions and millions of dollars building its brand, um, and and then somebody comes along and could wreck it. Well, that's that's a risk. Um, the the losses for uh, infringement on these is estimated to be about 60 billion and this is back like 2012 numbers so it's going to be higher now um, and losing those revenues means that those companies have less money to hire less money to do other other things in terms of conducting their business the other thing is is that you you could have counterfeiting that actually has a, a real problem uh, in fact I'll I'll post a link to this article uh, later uh, on canvas but Russia there was a town in Russia that um, in the last year, had a problem where um, their um, I, I, was it the vodka. So in this town, all of a sudden they just had a huge rash of people die for apparently no reason. They just went into seizures and died. And what they found was that um, that something in the manufacture of a of a drug that a lot of people in the town used was incorrect. So counterfeit pharmaceuticals can you know can can kill people and uh, that's that's bad for business so again we talked about how looking specifically at copyright laws common law is use establishes the right code law means registration establishes the right now, let me back up for that for a second so what that means is is that um, typically in the United States you need to um, you need to know when your trademark or your copyrighted product was first used in commerce. From that period of time, you have a certain amount of time to register your, your copyright, trademark, or patent. Um, and But it's still based on first use. Where in the code law countries, it's, it's a race to the patent office. The first person to register is the one who gets it. Um, I'm going to breeze through this one. This is a list of international conventions that affect how international property issues are settled. The biggest, um, the biggest agreement that uh, was up recently about that included intellectual property issues was the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and so, with that being essentially on hold uh, since Trump's election, uh, there are, there are still big questions about how international or intellectual property issues will be resolved. So there's a lot of ways you can influence the situation. Um, if you're if you're operating in a country, you know how well do you do you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening there, and do you know what to uh, preemptively do to to um, avoid problems? Um, you can also um, be open in, uh, to all types of negotiating uh, of negotiation and settlement. So um, you can you can make uh, complaints that are um, well received or um, or you can make complaints that aren't and run the risk so the internet is a, a, if we take a look at the age of the law the internet is a very new thing and the thing is that the law is always um, looking back um, we, we rarely make laws about how things will be in the future what usually happens is something happens right somebody uh, somebody gets a coffee that's too hot at McDonald's, or uh, somebody, you know, a, a railing doesn't hold, and somebody falls through and gets hurt. The law looks at things that happened in the past and uses that to um, to write laws for things that happen in the future. Well, the internet is relatively new, and so internet laws in the uh, in and the United States is at the forefront of development of both law and time log time logged with the the internet as part of commerce. So as you go to foreign uh, foreign countries, they may be nowhere near as um, sophisticated or complete as the U.S. is in terms of their, their internet laws. Or they may be very different. You know, the EU has a, has a much uh, different view of how inter the internet should work in business than the United States does. Um, so issues that, that affect, you know, how do you protect your domain name, uh, who pays taxes and where. Uh, you know, one of the, the um, discussion points that was about Apple and Ireland. Well, the EU is saying you go you owe us thirteen or fourteen billion dollars in taxes. So taxes are an issue uh, that that have to be dealt with. Jurisdiction, and how do you enter contracts to do your business? 
So new, even though um, the U.S. is out in front and the Internet is new, there are new laws being passed all over the place, and so this is something you got to kind of be aware of. Um, new laws are passed tackling, um, like I, I talked about the EU. Well, the EU doesn't like the fact that uh, the U.S. Uh, um, spies on its own people. So they have rules about data that affects EU citizens and whether that uh, data is where it's stored. Well, the whole notion of uh, cloud computing is the idea that that data is stored in the cloud. So that, I mean, the cloud is a is a metaphor for it's stored in server banks, right? It's a, it's at AWS at Amazon or it's at Google or um, or somewhere else. And so you have this kind of issue where the the EU cares a lot about where the data goes, and as a result, um, that thwarts a lot of the benefits of uh, of services and products that uh, could be offered in Europe that depend on cloud computing. Um, cyber squatting, you don't hear as much about this anymore, but um, you know the idea that uh, I'm going to go out and get a domain that belongs to some some other company, or, or that doesn't yet belong to them but reflects their name and their trademarks. Um, I think, do I have this? No. Okay, there was, a, there was a, a, a guy in Jordan, the country of Jordan, and he um, bought the domain for McDonald's with the Jordanian um, uh, suffix or uh, TLD, and they um, and as a result, McDonald's ended up um, licensing to him to run a McDonald's in Jordan. But but um, in the United States, McDonald's might have been able to unseat him and force him to give up that domain. But in Jordan, they're like, no, he got it first. Um, and so as a result, McDonald's uh, paid him to create, uh, to, to uh, use their name in Jordan. Um, certainly, taxes are always huge. I think we've done a pretty good job of covering uh, this as we've looked at tariffs and other things. Jurisdiction we talked about. Um, so it, we just touched a little bit on marketing laws, but take a look at some of these. So almost everybody has laws that regulate what you can do to promote your product, um, how you how it needs to be labeled, right? Do you do you show the ingredients? Do you have nutritional information? Do you have um, you know, how do you display prices? Um, and so here's a couple of examples of things that are a little different than what you see in the U.S. Austria, right? Premium offers, free gifts, and coupons are considered uh, that are considered as cash discounts or prohibited. So you can't offer dollars off. You can't offer gifts. Um, in Finland, the um, you can do premium offers, but only if you don't use the word free. Well, the word free is kind of a magic word for marketing, but not in Finland. And what about French law that permits sales only twice a year? January and August, you can have a sale. Otherwise, everything has to be business as usual. Well, again, if you're a, com a company that runs uh, a lot of its business on promotions, these may be countries that that, um, that strategy will not work well in. Um, so certainly there are things like the, the disposal of hazardous or environmental waste or the, the um, uh, you know, things that, that wreck the environment. All of those things can, can affect you. Um, they, but as a, if you're, let's say you're doing marketing for a consumer packaged goods company, well, you're going to be producing packaging. Um, and here at the end, like Germany has, has passed the most stringent green marketing laws. So everything has to be recycled. Everything has to be something that, that is sustainable. Um, and if that's not your practice or your pricing hasn't taken the extra cost of complying with that into effect, then that's something you need to reckon with in order to be successful doing business there. Um, here's a quick look at patents. So again, this is, this is another slice of common law versus code law. So patent law, right, the U.S. first to invent rule protects individual invent, invent individual inventors. Um, the uh, patents can be given in up to 24 months, so that's that's a relatively short period of time, and they're valid for 17 years. Uh, this depends a little bit on your industry, but, um, but you have essentially an opportunity to run with your invention and, and have a monopoly where you can you can reap the financial rewards, and, they, and this is done purely to incentivize um, investment in innovation. So in Japan, it's first to register. So whoever got to the patent office first, um, it's the idea is that open 
uh, open source and open technology is better, that that helps the common good. Um, patent applications are all uh, public, public documents, so you don't even have to do a freedom of information request. Uh, it takes a long time to get them, so four to six years to get a patent. Um, and then they're valid for a similar amount of time, 20 years instead of 17. Um, so if patents grant a monopoly, what other things do you need to be concerned about that, if, that, that monopolies might do? Um, and so there are, um, every country has taken a different approach to this, but antitrust laws are one of the things you need to be aware of. Are you going to be the only operator? Do you, do you own the market? How much market share do you have? And is that, uh, that going to be a trigger for a, a country to come and say, hey, look, you're, you're too big. We're going to have to break you up. And you see this Microsoft has gone through a bunch of this. Um, if you go back in U.S. history, um, the, the old, the old um, AT&T, uh, which, which they call Ma Bell because it was broken into the baby bells by antitrust um, lawyers. So here's another thing. Sometimes people feel like, hey, if I go out to another country and I earn money over in that other country, I'm not going to have to pay taxes on it. Um, but the home country may still exercise jurisdiction. Um, so if I, in the United States, for example, this is, this is also something that uh, Trump is, has been talking about, is reducing the tax rate for people bringing money back to the United States. That's called repatriation. Um, so if, a, if, a, if I go out and I do business in another country, for, let's say I go out and I do business in Brazil, and I make a ton of money, but if I bring that money back to the United States, I'm going to pay a bunch of tax on it, then it, I may say, well, it's not worth it to me. I'm going to, I'm going to leave that money in Brazil. I'm going to use it if I have to buy anything in Brazil. I have to hire people in Brazil. I'm going to keep that money in Brazil um, in order to avoid that taxation. Well, the, the United States is always going to look at you as that you owe, the, you owe tax on that money. And the, its ability to enforce that is going to come into play as soon as you try to bring that money back in the, into the United States. There it is. Okay, so that's the end of chapter six and seven. Uh, real quick, next week your cultural interview assignment is due. Um, this is this is a big one for the for the course. I think the points totals that I have here may be um, uh, may be off. This might relate to the previous semester, but here's the requirements: interview somebody from a culture other than your own. So somebody that's a that that can tell you about a culture you don't you don't know very much about. Um, should be three pages, single spaced as always, and describe it. One of the key things here is your SRC. You need to be able to not only report on your discussion with the with your interview subject, but you need to be able to, to talk about how you were able to identify your SRC, your self-referencing criterion. Um, and and how you, what that means is how you may have made other choices or assumptions, uh, other other um, approaches to similar situations to what you learn about in the foreign country because of your culture, where you were born, how you were brought up. Um, there is a full description of this on Canvas. You can check it out there. Okay, and this is the video I already posted. You don't need to uh, watch it here. So here's what's due next week. So we've got the, the uh, cultural interview and Learn Smart 5 and 6, and then the, the no class only applies to the in-face, or the face-to-face -face class. And then uh, the following week is the Euro Disney case, which is done as a team. And that is it for this week.